Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the launching conference of Bridging the Chasm Between Pregnancy and Women's Health Over the Life Course. I'm Lois McCloskey, a faculty member at the Boston University School of Public Health, and my most amazing fellow faculty member, colleague, and co-conspirator, Dr. Judith Bernstein, right here, would like to thank you all for joining us, those of you in this room, and those of you with us via Facebook Live. Those of you who are with us, we, you've committed a lot of time, you've committed two days of your time, in fact, to work together, during very busy lives and work schedules, I'm sure, and we are most grateful for that. You've come to share your expertise with each other and to generate innovative ideas that will shape a national agenda for bridging chasms. And those chasms are all within <coughs> women's health care. And <clears throat> we're going to do that hard work together for two days, and we're going to have a lot of fun while we're doing it. So, what are these chasms? What are the problems that we're here to address? I'd like each of us for 10 seconds to evoke an image of a chasm. Deep, dark, often long-standing, craggy, rough, Scary, downright frightening to leap across, and without a bridge or some sort of zip cord or something, um, very hard to leap across. And so, we end up having to walk miles and miles to get around to the other side. And in this case, those miles and miles are walked by women between their pregnancy, often complicated and difficult, to the other <coughs> side of care for themselves over the long term, especially right after pregnancy, but not only. So that is especially hard for women from low, who, without a lot of resources, for new mothers with a lot of demands on them otherwise. That can be a very treacherous road. So chasm number one, that's it. The deep divide between our very big investment in women while they're pregnant and our lack of investment in women after they're pregnant, between pregnancies, beyond pregnancies, especially ones that are complicated, and to care about their health over the life course for the sake of themselves. So that's the big picture. But because it is such a giant big picture, we've chosen here today to focus on a very specific condition, gestational diabetes, and the trajectory for on to type 2 diabetes and in fact, heart disease as well. So we know that 60% of women with, we'll call it GDM, gestational diabetes, go on to develop type 2 diabetes within the next 10 years. We know yet that most women, truly most women, do not receive either testing right after that pregnancy and certainly not beyond and are not connected to primary care afterwards for continued care and monitoring and prevention. So we even know what the barriers are. We know that GDM is just one pathway of many that would allow us to prevent much of type 2 diabetes among women if we paid attention. It's not the only one, but it's important and it's really important because of the growing epidemic of obesity in our country and nationally. So one in 10 women have a diagnosis, adult women have a diagnosis of diabetes. That, that rate is twice for those women who are black, Caribbean, or um, Latina, or native. And so the prevalence is even growing faster among women than men in our country. So tackling this gap between, for GDM, for women with GDM is, um, will take us a very long way, not only to prevent type 2, but then will pave the way for other gaps, closing other gaps, and preventing other long-term health conditions among women. So that's the first chasm for the day. That's the big one. The second chasm that I want us all to be aware of, aware of as we start our work is the chasm between those who deliver and design and administer health care and those who receive it. 
Let's call us patients. We're all patients, right? So patients need a voice, and without their voice at the table of designing systems and services that work for women, that walk around the chasm is going to be extremely uh, circuitous, bureaucratic, as it is, and often that walk is just not even worth it for women, especially women, again, with lower resources. Chasm number three. That's the one of, between the resources we have available to women who are from high resource communities and those from lower resource communities. So every community we know has lots and lots of assets. But women cannot, at least not easily, change their diet, change their exercise, and take care of themselves while holding double, triple jobs to make a living wage, experiencing the implicit bias that we know is kind of baked into healthcare often, institutional racism baked into our housing policies and access to safe environments, to healthy food that's affordable. So place really matters, and racism really matters. We know that. Chasm number four. This is the last chasm that I'll talk about anyway. That's the one between what we know and what we do. So I know from talking to many of you that you're tired as I'm tired of knowing so much about what we need to do and not doing it. So for GDM, for example, we know all about the disease process. We know even about what, how we fail women to not follow up. Like I said, we know what the barriers are. We know how to prevent type 2 diabetes. And um, we do make some good attempts, incremental as they are, to try to help women change their behaviors. But most of our attempts are, in fact, just that, attempts to change individuals' behaviors. So where's the deeper change, the deeper change in the system, the recognition of the communities that need to change? in order for, and the system, which is more also where our focus is today, needs to change for this chasm to be crossed. So let's all now evoke a different image, an image of a very strong, sturdy, reliable bridge across that chasm. And let's envision women walking across that bridge before, they're pregnant, during, after, and long beyond. Much as our logo, beautifully designed by Megan Smith, conveys. Building bridges like that is hard. And I'm, I remember, I'm, I'm called to remember bridges across really big, narrow, scary chasms in rural Nepal, where I had my very first public health job. And I couldn't even believe bridges were built across these chasms. Like, who, who could do that? They were swinging and rickety and scary, but nonetheless, bridges across a chasm. And those took a village to build. And it's really no different for us. It's going to take a village. A village with rich and varied experience and expertise, because it's complex. And complex problems call for innovation and collaboration and all kinds of multi-pronged solutions. And that's why we're here. That's why you're here. And thank you again for being here. Patients, providers, researchers, advocates, health systems leaders, policy and program planners. It's going to take all of us and more. It's going to take those of you and us who have been paying attention and trying to get attention on issues like the incredibly unacceptable high rates of black maternal mortality. And finally getting a little traction in the public press about that. Those of you who are here because you've worked on perinatal depression legislation to get support for women after pregnancy, or those who work fight for respectful maternity care, or in fact many of you researched gestational diabetes and the problems of follow-up. So we have a lot to learn from each other. And we're not doing this work in a very positive political environment, are we? 
And that's all the more reason why we have to be here to, with each other together going forward and think really creatively. So in the next two days, obviously we can't build the bridge, we can't even fully design it, but we're going to give it a go and we're going to start to design it. By the end of our two days together, we will have shared stories with each other across our areas of expertise and experience. We will have brainstormed solutions, and we will have chosen some of those solutions that seem to us collectively to be the most innovative and the most promising. And then we're going to go at it and see what the challenges would be, what the resources, what collaborations are needed to make them happen. Could they happen? And begin to talk about how they could happen. And this will be the national agenda that we've promised to begin work on in these next two days and continue our work. This is not going to be the end. In fact, we hope all of you will continue to be part of the Bridging the Chasm network that we, <coughs> excuse me, have um, support to continue at least for the next year, we hope more. <coughs> excuse me, through an online portal. So keep your eyes open, everyone out there in Facebook land as well, for bridge-the-chasm.com. It's coming to you early this fall. So we hope that will be the stage, the platform upon which many of you will begin to collaborate with each other. As Peter Senge, the organizational leadership guru, tells us, everybody wants to focus on pressing problems but usually it's as they define them. But in facing truly complex problems, no one sees the whole. We all see only portions of the larger system. And this is not bad, in fact, it's human. And so it is that we've chosen to work today together, in day one especially, to be very human together, to share our stories, to even do some improvisational theater. <laughs> the art we're going to use to get us out of our linear ways of thinking and into our imaginations. So, let me end there and begin to introduce those who have been with us all the way along the way to make this conference and this initiative happen. And I'm going to start by introducing our Stakeholder Leadership Council. You'll notice that each person I'm about to inter introduce has a gold star that go on their name tag and that gold star is because they do A plus work. <laughs> and also because we want you to be able to recognize who they are. So please stand when I mention you. <clears throat> First are those who represent the community and patient advocacy constituency. Linda Goler Blount. There you are. Executive Director of the Black Women's Health Imperative. We've been here. <clears throat> we will hear from Linda in just a bit as our first panelist, so I won't say more about you or the Black Women's Health in Imperative. Um, second is um, Athena Ramos, who wasn't able to be with us today. She's representing the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, but she just had a baby. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, Athena. Her fourth, actually. Um, and third, um, we're represented um, we're, we're joined by Anna Norton and Sarah Martin from Diabetes Sisters. Unfortunately, Anna's not able to be with us, but we're so glad you are, Sarah. Where are you? There you are. And um, joined by many Diabetes Sisters who are here with us, and we thank you for coming from all over the country. Corinna from Hawaii. <laughs> Is that amazing? Um, and Sarah, I would love you to take just a, one moment to say, tell us what Diabetes Sisters is. Sure, hi everyone. Diabetes Sisters is our tiny but strong and thriving nonprofit um, serving women with every and any type of diabetes across the lifespan um, and working for them to uh, increase both their health and quality of life through our plethora of online services, diabetessisters.org, as well as in-person peer support groups. We have about 45 so far across the country. And um, as Lois said, we have seven members of our Diabetes Sisters patient advocate community here in the room with us today, and we're so thrilled that they could join us. 
Thank you, Sarah. I also wanted to mention, as I was introducing Linda, the Black Women's Health Imperative, as well as um, those from BMC, we have lots of patients here representing those two groups, and we welcome you as well, and really look forward to working with you and hearing stories as the day goes on. Uh, next is uh, the representative from Health Policy and Research, Dr. Janine Austin Clayton, Director of Women's Health for NIH and the Office of Research on Women's Health. Hi, uh, Dr. Clayton, you will also be hearing from, from her in a moment, so no more. Uh, we'll hear from you later. <clears throat> and representing Health Systems Transformation stakeholder is Ann Greiner, President and CEO of Patient Centered Primary Care Collaborative. Just a sentence or so, Ann, about sure. your group. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we're uh, focused on making primary care more robust and more patient centered. We help to uh, garner consensus around the patient centered medical home model and uh, foster its adoption by both public and private payers. And our final partners um, are from Boston University. Dr. Aviva Lee Peretz, Chair of OBGYN and an expert in diabetes. Welcome. And Tracy Battaglia, our head of our Women's Health Unit at BU in uh, General Internal Medicine, unfortunately was unable to be here today. Um, and then Linda Sprague Martinez from the School of Social Work, an, an avid PCORI um, patient centered and community centered action researcher. And then um, two more, Susie Sarfordy um, may not be quite here yet. She and Chase Crossnoach, Susie's from BU um, in Assistant Dean for Community and Global Health Programs and is a primary care physician and also a communication specialist. Um, and then Chase Crossno from the University of North Texas and Texas Christian University Medical School. And I'll be introducing Chase because she is our fabulous leader for the improvisational work we're going to do. I'll introduce you later. So finally, our most generous funders, not just the agencies, but the people who have um, made this happen in the end. First, we have a PCORI grant. For those who don't know, Patient-Centered Outcome Research Initiative. Uh, we have Eugene Washington Conference Grant, and they have, in fact, given us the bulk of the funding. Um, their mission is all about patient engagement to improve health outcomes. Our wonderful program officer, Yasmin Long, unfortunately, wasn't able to make the trip. She sends her regrets. Uh, NIH, NIDDK. So we want to call out Dr. Drew Bremer. There you are. I will stand, but hello, everyone. <laughs> Drew represents the most forward thinking of program officers at the NIH, we can tell you. Right? <laughs> Embedded in our proposal to conduct a big data analysis of follow up after GDM, we stuck in this little conference an initiative to, <clears throat> in very innovative ways, to come up with some solutions and disseminate results. And you saw the vision, Drew, early on and allow that to stay in the proposal after we were funded, thank you very much, and then continue to do some outreach to um, make sure we got even more funding. And that's when you reached out to Dr. Janine Clayton, who stepped right up and added some funds from the Office of Research on Women's Health. We are so grateful to you, Dr. Clayton. You're leading the way to a more holistic and cross-disciplinary forward-thinking approach on research, about research in women's health. And now I want to invite you to come and make some welcoming remarks. Thank you. 